it's good to be a part of this church. And as I get to know this church, um, I really look forward to working together with you in God's cause. We have been put here for a special time and for a special purpose. And my prayer is that God would help us to understand what his plans are for us. I would really like to make a special plea. Please come to prayer meeting. I would like to take this church down a path that maybe the church hasn't been down recently, and that's to really develop a mission strategy. And for this to work, everybody has to be involved in this process. As many people as possible. Because I don't believe in top-down. I really believe in, you know, basically we all have to come together. And it has to come from the bottom up in a way. So, you know, this is not about my project. It's not about, you know, my ambitions or my dreams. But it's really about our project and what we're about. And if you care about us, if you care about God's cause and God's house, uh, you will want to come on Wednesday night. It is a sacrifice. But, you know, Jesus has sacrificed everything for us. And we will see the, the fruits of this sacrifice in the kingdom. And I don't think we will be disappointed. Amen. The last Sabbath I spoke here, I started a journey together with you through the Bible. My first sermon uh, in this journey attempted to show that the creation story parallels the redemption story. For example, we see that God takes uh, a dark, unformed planet and he turns it into a beautiful place. God uses the power of his word and his spirit to accomplish this dramatic change. So too in the redemptive story. God takes a sinful people, turns them into an obedient and loving people. God uses the power of his word and spirit to accomplish this dramatic change. The parallels between creation and redemption are simple, and yet they are stunning and profound. We saw how the writers of the Psalms built their confidence in God on these parallels. Their logic was that if God was able to create the world, then we are able to trust him to vanquish evil and to save us. They saw the natural world as a powerful testimony to God's saving power. They were creationists in the highest sense of the word because they lived out their faith in the Creator. Today I want to look at another parallel between the creation story and the redemption story and explore its significance for us today. The particular parallel between these two stories that we'll be looking at today is revealed when we compare the goal of God's creative power and the goal of his creative actions. Both of them have the same goal in common. Can you guess what their common goal is? Well, let's not jump to conclusions. Instead, let us follow the creation story and see if we can discover together God's goal for creation and for salvation. Now, we observe in Genesis chapter 1 that God's creative activity is remarkably purpose-driven. Each step, each successive step that God takes builds on the preceding step. The first three days set the stage for the last three days. The first five days builds up to the climatic sixth day. And when God accomplishes his goal, he rests on the seventh. Now let us follow the logic of God's creative activity. God begins his creative activity by shining light in our dark, water-covered earth. And then he proceeds to separate the light and the darkness from each other. We don't know exactly how he did this. But could it be that he initially created a diffuse blanket of light to light the earth, and then he proceeded to focus that light into a beam of light that also casts a shadow on the opposite side of the earth? The focus beam of light would have created a light side and a dark side. This would have established the daily night-day cycle that we have today. Now, readers are sometimes baffled by the fact that God creates light before he creates the sun, the moon, and the planets, in our solar system. But we don't have to be baffled by this because God follows um, 
sound physical and spiritual principles when he builds or when he creates. Now, from a physical standpoint, he could not have created the sun and the planets first. Why? Because the earth was not ready to be under the gravitational pull of the sun, the moon, and the planets. First, God had to shape the earth's crust because the placement of the earth's mass on the surface would naturally affect um, the way that the earth interacted with the sun and the moon. Not until the third day would the earth be ready to rotate around the sun in the correct way and interact with the moon in the right way. So although he couldn't position the earth with the sun and the moon until the earth was ready, he needed the thermodynamic power of the light because the darkness and light would help him to keep the oceans separated from all the moisture in the atmosphere. The light and the darkness was like an engine, a thermodynamic engine. Now from a spiritual standpoint, God needed also to create the light first because creation was to be an illustration of redemption. And light is a symbol of the true knowledge of God that shines forth from his son, Jesus Christ. Not from the sun or from nature. Now John writes, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Now the Bible says that God is jealous for his name. He doesn't want to misconstrue where true knowledge of his will and character come from. It comes from his son Jesus and not any lesser light. In the ancient world, religions worshipped the son instead of the creator because they either ignored or forgot this important lesson. Another spiritual lesson why day and night were created independently of the creation of the sun is the fact that time comes from God. This is an important lesson because philosophers through the centuries have looked down at time. They have falsely construed time with getting old, dying, and destruction. So instead of seeing time as something good, they saw it as something necessary but evil. This affected their conception of God. They were forced to conceive of God as an abstract, timeless being or concept instead of a living person because time was unworthy of God in their minds. Their ideas of God made God distant, passive, and uninvolved in the world that we live in. So what a tragedy. If they had only studied the true creation account preserved in Revelation, they would not have made this mistake. God's creative activity described in Genesis chapter 1 really preempts this misunderstanding by establishing the fact that time comes directly from God. God is not a timeless, abstract being. He acts in time and space. He's a personal, living God. And death doesn't come from time. It comes from disobedience and sin. Now, we cannot spend an equal amount of time in each day because this would just take too long. Instead, I want to outline for you the way the six days of creation fit together with view of trying to understand God's purpose. Now, what's very interesting is that on the first three days, and you've probably observed this yourself, he creates the form, right? In the beginning, it was formless. So he starts by creating the forms. Light, darkness, the atmosphere and the ocean, the dry land and the vegetation. Those are the forms. And then he proceeds in the last three days, or the next three days, I should say, to fill these forms with content. So he fills the lightness and the darkness with the sun, the moon, and the planets. And these were to mark out the lightness and the darkness. On the second day, God creates the atmosphere and the oceans. And then on the fifth day, he fills them with the birds and the, and the ocean animals. Notice that he doesn't fill the atmosphere with the birds or ocean animals right away because he needs vegetation and dry land. He needs the sun, the moon, and the stars in place before the air is ready to be filled with birds and the sea with sea creatures. On the third day, he creates the dry land and the vegetation. And then on the sixth day, he fills them with land animals and humans. And this could only be done at that point. Now, God's cre creative activity is like building a house. When you build a house, you need the foundation before you can build the walls. You need the outer walls before you can build the inner walls. When everything is built, the family can move in. 
Now, each step of the way, God announces that his creation is good. He announces when he's done with the land animals that it's good. It's not until he comes to humankind that he says it is excellent or it's very good. So only when he reaches his goal is he fully satisfied. What is the end goal of creation? Well, the answer seems simple, but there's a lot of profoundness in this. The end goal is really the creation of beings who were in his image. And we need to unpack the meaning of this. Let us make man our image after our likeness. Now, this is the only expression in the creation story where God says what his intention is. This was God's exceedingly bold and lofty purpose. He wanted creatures that would be like him. Can you imagine this? The creator and the ruler wanted creatures like himself. Now, the Hebrew word for image, zelem, and the Hebrew word for likeness, domot, are also used in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. Now, I want you to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, in order to better understand these concepts of likeness and image. Now, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, Moses wrote these words. He said, When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Now, the word image and the word likeness are used here to express the physical and the character similarities between Adam and his son Seth. It is no accident that Moses uses these precise words to describe the kind of beings that God wanted to create. These words provide insight into God's ultimate purpose with creation. He wants children who would love him and who he could love. That's what he wants. The Bible supports his understanding of the image and likeness by identifying Adam as the son of God. Right? Luke 3.38, where he's called the son of God. So when God brought forth his children, he had reached his goal. And so he rested from his work and spent time with his children, enjoying fellowship with them on the Sabbath. Wow! He wanted children. Now, this is very beautiful. It gives a whole new meaning to creation and the Sabbath day. God's creation is all about God creating family, and the Sabbath is about family time. Now, God has given to us the same desire for family so that we can understand his desire for family. He wanted creatures who he could pour out his love upon. He wanted creatures that have the capacity to know him, to relate to him, to trust him, and to love him in return. He wanted children. He longed for children. Can you believe it? The creator of the universe wanting children. Now, it's really awe-inspiring that God created us to be his children with a longing to have children. Now this begs the question, what does our family resemblance to God consist of? Let's look at the Bible text. In Genesis chapter 2, 28, we read, be fruitful and multiply. This is the, the first characteristic that makes them like God. God has given to us the ability and the desire to create loving families. Now this expression goes well beyond procreation. We are meant to find deep, fulfilling, loving relationships just like God. Our lives from birth to death are intricately connected to family. We are born into a family and we eventually fa form families of our own. Just like God, humankind was given the desire for family and the ability to sustain family. We were created to be deeply moral beings so that we could create and sustain these relationships. Without morality, we would never start, we could never start a relationship in the right way, nor could we sustain these relationships in the right way. So without a capacity for faithfulness and kindness, affection, openness, consideration, and thoughtfulness, we couldn't have healthy relationships. They wouldn't get off the ground and they would freeze up after a while. Now, it's interesting that the Bible uses the word multiply. This is an important word. It indicates that God put within man the divine capacity for unlimited relationship building. 
You know, our natures were not just built for the nuclear family relationship. He created us to also have relationship with our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And all the family relationships that extend into the far distant, uh, far distance. He created us to show actually agape love to all people because we are all part of the same family. We are one big family. Now, you know, this longing for family is really strong. I, I heard a story that was tremendously powerful of this young man who grew up longing to have uh, a child, a daughter. And God gave to him a dream where he was told the name that this child should have. And the name was Chloe. And he, he ended up, you know, marrying a, a beautiful woman and they tried to have children but just weren't able to have children and they were really sorrowing over this reality of being childless. And they struggled with this for a long time. They were deep Christians, deep personal Christians. And so they believed that somehow, you know, God would have a plan. But they doubted. They doubted sometimes, really, that God could, could do something with their lives. And then they started thinking about actually adopting a child. And uh, he really struggled with this a lot. He wanted, you know, a biological child. And so they struggled with this for a while. Finally, you know, he said yes to this. No, I sort of forgot a part already, and that was when they were dating, she actually told him that she would like a daughter. And she wanted a daughter, actually, with the name Chloe. And he was shocked, actually, because he had had this dream many years before where God had shown him that the child would be Chloe. So what do you do? You have this dream, you have this desire to have a daughter. Well, they actually decided that they would adopt a daughter. And that they adopted a daughter here in the States. And uh, the mother came to them before the adoption was complete and said that she would like actually to name the child. And I'm sure that was a little bit of a disappointment on their behalf, on their part. But the mother said, you know what, I would like my daughter to be named Chloe. And they hadn't talked to each other actually about this. But God had all along been preparing the way for this adoption. And I think it's really beautiful because it shows that every child is planned. Yeah. Planned by a God who longs for children. Now the second um, similarity between us and God is that God created us to be masters and not slaves. He said subdue it and have dominion over it. Now, God has given to us a higher intelligence than other creatures. All creatures have intelligence to some degree. Um, but we have a higher degree of thinking and planning and executing. We have greater skill. We have greater freedom. We have greater language abilities. Even though other animals also have language abilities. We are not to be slaves of our circumstances, but we are to be leaders. Now the third uh, quality that goes along with the second quality is that God created us to be caretakers and not killers. Now God said that they, are to, they were to work the garden and they were to keep it. And when you look at the story you see how the first step in caretaking is really to know your domain. And so God brings every single creature in front of him so that he would know the creatures, be able to understand them, label them, because in order to take care, we need to know the world around us. It's through knowledge that we have compassion, both upon the natural world and upon other people. One of the reasons why prejudice exists is because of a lack of knowledge, a lack of contact with other people. Now, originally we were created to be vegetarians uh, because God did not want us to kill, but he wanted us to take care. Now let me summarize. So our likeness to God consists of our moral capacity for loving relationships, what we call character. It consists of higher intelligence, greater willpower, greater freedom than other animals. And it consists of our ability to know and care for the world around us. Now okay, this is something we all know. But what is the true significance of our likeness to God? Our likeness to God, I believe, allows for us to have a relationship with him even though he is infinitely greater than we are,
Because we are like him in these areas, we can think his thoughts. We can appreciate and understand his language. We can appreciate him and we can do his will because of these similarities. Isn't it amazing that he wants to have this kind of intimate relationship where we can do his will, we can understand him, we can think his thoughts after him? This is what it means to be a son and a daughter of God. But we also have to remember that we are also unlike God in many ways. It says that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. Now God will always be our father. He will always be our sustainer, our lawgiver, our guide, our caretaker and helper. We will always be dependent on him. So this is how we are different than him. But we were created to be like him in terms of our love, our leadership and our caretaking. Now the tragedy in this story is that we left our celestial creator. We have left his place and we wandered away from him like the prodigal son. And we have lost this likeness to him. It has become distorted, warped by Satan's dysfunctional warring family. We've lost much of our capacity to be in a relationship with God. The less we are like the Father, the less of a capacity we have to know him. But the Father wants us back. So our study of the creation story shows us that his goal was to create man and women, men and women, to be his children. But what is the purpose of, his, of salvation? Now the purpose of salvation is the same as creation. He wants children. He wants his children back. This is the glorious plan that he has. Now Ellen White summarizes the purpose of salvation in the book Education. And this is really a profound little... Um, paragraph that uh, we should remember because it kind of summarizes everything. She says, by infinite love and mercy, the plan of salvation had been devised and a life of probation was granted. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body and mind and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. This is a tremendous, you know, paragraph. The plan of salvation is stunningly ambitious. God's plan is to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring back the perfection that was there in the beginning. So God has set for himself the uncompromising goal of achieving what he set out to do in creation. And he's not going to be hindered. He has not compromised his original intention at all. Now, this is a great plan. I am awed by it. And you know what? It's impossible for us to do this by ourselves. But for God, it is possible. And there are many places in Scripture where this plan is outlined. And I just want to bring you to one text that to me is a stunningly beautiful text that really goes into the detail of this. And this, found, this is found in the 8th chapter of Romans. And if you have your Bible, I would like you to open to the 8th chapter of Romans. And we're going to start just with verse 29 and 30. Because this text really helps us to understand God's intention with both creation and with salvation. And we're going to read several texts here in, in Romans 8 um, and talk about them a little bit. And we know says Paul, that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now this is a beautiful, beautiful text. Let us reflect on this wonderful message for a moment. Paul writes that God has a single overarching purpose for those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. He decided at the beginning that they should become like his son. He, his determined plan is that we should become his children in the manner that his son, Jesus, is his son. Now, how does he make this happen? This is what we're going to study now. Three steps. He predestines us. 
Now, he predestined us to be like his son by sending his son to this earth to be an atonement for our sins. And he raised him to life to be our mediator. So by sacrificing his son, he met the full legal demands of the broken law on our behalf. And once the legal demands for our disobedience were fully met, he was justified in providing the full power of the Holy Spirit for the full restoration of our broken and rebellious lives to full obedience. Now he has carried out his plan in providing all that is necessary for our full restoration as sons and daughters. He has thereby predestined us to be his children. He has poured out all heavenly blessings to make it possible for us to reach this goal. He has sacrificed everything possible for us. He has done and continues to do all to make this a reality. So we are indeed predestined to be conformed to his son by his death and resurrection power. So that's the first stage. The second step that he's done is he has called us. Now, we would not be able to start this journey towards conformity to his dear son unless he had called us individually and continues to call us to accept what he has done for us and what he's doing for us. What is his call? It is his revealing of his love for us. It is his invitation for us to believe and to trust in his son. It is his reminding to yield our lives to him. It is him placing upon our hearts the need to confess our sins and repent. So his calling leads us step by step towards heaven. He beckons us onward. Will we hear his calling and respond to him? It is up to us to respond to the Spirit's calling, wooing, and pleading. He says, surrender to Jesus. So God has predestined us. He has done everything possible by giving his Son. And then he calls us to accept this. But we must choose. The third thing he mentions is that he has justified us. Now he justifies those who yield their lives to Jesus, those who say yes to this call. He covers them with his righteousness. So instead of our past sins standing against us, we, they are remitted, our sins are forgiven, remitted for Christ's sake. And so he writes pardon behind our names. He places the righteous life of Christ in place of our wicked, wicked past. And he gives us then an inner peace and joy as confirmation of this transaction. Now what a glorious gift. Amen. It is really beyond belief. Amen. Now the fourth stage comes together with this because this is all a package that he gives. He glorifies us. Now this is something that we need to reflect a little bit more upon than the first uh, three because I think we, understand, we misunderstand this particular point. So not only does he cover his children with his righteousness, those who yield to him, but he glorifies them with the righteousness of Christ. He imbues those who are yielded to him with his righteous character. He makes them gloriously righteous. He makes them partakers in his righteousness. He makes them obedient and loving through their faith in him. So he passes his character on to them, so they reflect his glory. Now, how does he do this? He does this through his spirit. This is a gradual process that moves from glory to glory until the second coming of Christ, when we'll be fully glorified with the new body at his coming. Now, Paul writes about this process of glorification in 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 18. Let's just read this together. Because this really is what helps us to understand what he says in Romans. Now the Lord is the Spirit, says Paul, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So glorification is not just something that happens at the end, at the resurrection, when we receive a new body. It actually is happening now, as we become more and more like Jesus. 
So the Spirit brings this freedom to become like Jesus. As we look with helplessness and neediness to Jesus in prayer, we will be transformed more and more to his image, to the work of the Spirit in our lives. Now our job is to look to Jesus in faith. We are to wait upon Jesus as children. We are to trust in Jesus for help. Like little children, we are to seek him in contrite prayer. Our work is to look continually to Jesus with steadfast faith. Now this is really, really important because we are his children and we need to be asking for wisdom to do the simple tasks of life at our work, at our job. You know, I was talking to, we were in prayer meeting last time, the last few times, I guess, in, in Winston, and Kenton, who is the elder there, was just telling us how he has been praying about different tasks that he has at work. He works, I think, with web design and things like that, and there were problems that he couldn't solve and problems that nobody else could solve, and he would lift these things up to God in prayer, and God would give him the solutions. And I was thinking, you know, that's really the kind of child relationship that God wants with us, where he wants to give us his divine guidance in our finances, in every aspect of our lives. This reminds us of the importance of prayer. We are to exercise childlike faith in him. Prayer is not an option, actually, as a Christian. It is the option. It is the way of living as a Christian. Personal and corporate prayer are exceedingly important components. It is through prayer, really, that we live out this reality of being children of God. Now, in Romans 8, 14, verse 14 and 17, he develops this, the importance of prayer. If you will just open to Romans 8, this is the chapter that we're looking at, verse 14 through 17. For all, he says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. And then he goes on. So the ones who are being led by God's spirit are God's children, he says. And how are they being led? Well, God's Spirit caused them to pray. God's children have the spirit of prayer. They have received the spirit of adoption, which is the spirit of praying, Abba, Father. Father has become so intimately familiar to them that they pray to him as Abba, Father. So prayer is a defining characteristic of these children. It is central to the Christian life. And we really underestimate the importance of prayer. And this has a tragic consequence. It leads to weakness and spiritual poverty in the Christian church. Now, prayer is more than just a habit. It is actually a mode of living. It is living faith in practice. Now, Paul writes that creation longs for the day when God's children will be revealed to the world at the resurrection. After they have been tested and tried through suffering to see if they are faithful. So the creation longs for these children to be fully manifested to the world. This to me is a beautiful, beautiful concept. That the world is looking for God's children to be revealed here on earth. To be fully revealed. And they are looking to see if we are living as children today. So nature groans for something. It longs for this one thing. That God's children would be revealed. Now, our main purpose here on earth is God's purpose, and that is to become his children. To walk in his spirit, to walk in an attitude of prayer, and to have his character. Now, Ellen White writes about this in a very particular way. She says, Christ is waiting with longing for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly re reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. My friends, that is what is holding God back. That is what he is longing for. The Father has done everything to clear the way for us to be like his children. He has predestined us to reach this goal. He has given us the call. The way is clear. 
He has given to us his spirit. Will we progress? Will we go forward? Will we make this our focus, our purpose in this life? Now, you know, God's love is so great, and this is really the foundation of everything. And I just want to end with a text, I mean, with a story, a real story that kind of illustrates um, God's love for us as a father. Now, December uh, 7, 1988, there was an earthquake that devastated large portions of Armenia, killing an estimated 25,000 people. In one small town, just after the earthquake, a father rushed to his son's school only to find that the school had been flattened. There was no sign of life. But he had no thought of turning back. He had often told his son, no matter what, I will be there for you when you need me. Now those prospects appeared hopeless. The father began feverishly to remove the rubble from where he believed his son's classroom was. There were many other parents that were wailing helplessly, my son or my daughter. Some even told the father to go home. There was no chance of any of these children being found alive. But he replied, I made my son a promise that I would be there for them any time he needed me. So I must continue to dig. Now, courageously, he worked alone. No one volunteered to help him because they didn't believe in this project. But he had to know for himself if his son was alive or if he was dead. Now, he found the strength, and he continued on eight hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours. And then on the 38th hour, as he heaved the stones away from the pile of rubble, he heard a voice. Armand, he screamed. And a child's voice responded, Dad, it's me, Armand. Then he, I, the boy told the other kids, don't worry. My dad is here to save us. He promised, and I knew he'd come. You did it, Dad. So moments later, the dad helped his son and 13 other kids, frightened, hungry, thirsty, boys and girls, climb out of the debris, free at last. So when the building collapsed, these kids were saved. Now, the townspeople, they praised Armand's dad. And his explanation was, I promised my son, no matter what, I would be there for you. You know what? God has promised. He has predestined us. He has done everything. He loves us so much. We have a fantastic God. We need to just trust him and rely fully upon him. May God be with you as you work together with him and cooperate together with him in living out the life of Jesus and forming your character to his character. May God bless you. Let us pray a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this grand plan of redemption that is so bold, so audacious, and yet we know that because you are loving and all-powerful God, you are able to do it. And we just put our trust in you and pray that we would hold that close relationship with you so that we could be your children and you can use us in a powerful way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.